Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Maggie Howell, and I'm the executive director here at the Wolf Conservation Center. Um, some quick tips before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your control panel, and we'll provide time for a Q&A session at the end of this evening's presentation. Also, a recorded version of the webinar will be available on our website um, within a day or two. And that's really it, so let's get started. Um, I'm really excited. Today we're joined by Dr. Sherry Asa, who has generously offered her time to discuss the role of reproductive management in Mexican gray wolf recovery. Dr. Asa graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a BA, double major in zoology and psychology, and an MS and PhD in endocrinology and reproductive physiology. She recently retired from the St. Louis Zoo after almost 30 years as Director of Reproductive and Behavioral Sciences, but continues her work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Mexican Wolf Recovery Program and the Mexican Wolf Species Survival Plan. Her first research experience with gray wolves was in Minnesota with David Meech, where she studied olfactory communication as well as reproduction. In 1990, she was asked by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to establish a semen bank for Mexican gray wolf, for the Mexican gray wolf at the St. Louis Zoo. Uh, that bank has since expanded to include eggs and ovarian tissue from female wolves as well. In addition, her lab at the zoo has pioneered assisted reproduction methods, such as artificial insemination for management of Mexican wolf population genetics. So now, without any further ado, uh, let me make sure she's not muted. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm going to turn the time over to Sherry. So thank you for joining us, Sherry. Thank you, Maggie, and I'm especially happy to be here during Lobo Week. <laughs> As my title suggests, uh, wolves are really special to me. I've been working with them for a very long time. Um, but to, get, to talk about uh, what is happening with wolves and where we stand, uh, Mexican gray wolves once were throughout the southwestern U.S. and down into Mexico, but they were considered extinct in the wild. Yet there were three captive lineages, so three places, people at three places, McBride, Ghost Ranch, and uh, Aragon had captured some and brought them into captivity and were breeding them. So when U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service found out about that, uh, they talked with these people and those wolves were then the founders of the captive breeding program that started in 1997. So following that, but not until 1993, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, that's AZA, the accrediting body, the professional organization for zoos in the U.S., uh, started the Mexican Wolf Species Survival Plan. So that's the special kind of program that AZA has for endangered species. So that program for Mexican wolves was established in 1993, but in a with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And today there are 53 zoos and wild wolf conservation centers in the U.S. and in Mexico, holding a total of 390 Mexican wolves, all from those original seven. And it's a bi-national recovery program, which is especially exciting to work with because <clears throat> it's managed jointly by in the U.S., the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Program and the AZA Mexican Wolf SSP, but always in cooperation with their Mexican counterparts. So the role of captive breeding was especially important for this species. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the U.S. owns all those Mexican wolves, but they're housed at zoos and wolf conservation centers. And those centers then take care of them, breed them and uh, provide all of their care. Then starting in 1998, wolves that came out of that captive breeding program were began to be reintroduced into Arizona and New Mexico. And what's especially exciting about that for biologists interested in reintroduction is that all those wolves came from captive bred ancestors which is something that people had predicted wouldn't work. They were born in captivity. How would they know what to do? But in fact, they did. They formed natural social groups and they knew how to hunt. They were successful. 
but the problems have come with their interactions with people. And something that's becoming a predominant theme in conservation nowadays is this human wildlife conflict where wild species then um, encroach on a habitat that humans are taking, various problems like that. That's what's happening with Mexican wolves in the wild. Their current range in Arizona and New Mexico is shown on this figure, but there also have been releases in Mexico, uh, south of that border, in the Sierra Madre Occidental um, um, mountain range. I was hoping and <laughs> that today I would have a count for you from uh, Arizona and New Mexico, but U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service just finished that count for last year. And it's going to be released soon, but it's not available yes, yet today. So the count that I am giving you here, that 130, is from last year. So we don't know right now how much that might have changed. Uh, but back to the captive population, which is the I work with, um, that history <clears throat> that seven founders uh, makes genetic management really important. That's a really small number of individuals to contribute their genes to a breeding program. But all Mexican wolves that are alive today came from those seven animals. So this is, uh, and they're healthy, they're doing well. So this is credit to those population geneticists. And so our role in many ways is to help preserve genes from individuals. And even when uh, they're, they have died, we can then use those genes through artificial insemination uh, in the current population. So in 1990, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service approached me. I had just started working at the St. Louis Zoo and asked if we would develop a frozen semen bank. The zoo agreed, and so the rest is history. <laughs> For the last 30 years, I've been collecting and freezing semen. But something else we could do, because every time you collect semen, you need to know the quality that you're freezing. And so that allowed us to evaluate the fertility of those individual males. So those three lineages that I mentioned, here's what the line breeding looked like. So in each of those populations, all of the wolves that were being produced came from those original animals. So in McBride, there were just three. In Ghost Ranch, there were just two, just one pair. In Aragon, again, just one pair of wolves. So they had become very inbred by the time U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service started that captive breeding program. So it was important, since we believed they were all Mexican gray wolves, but it was very important that that be verified genetically. So samples were taken from each of those lineages and they were analyzed in the lab of Dr. Robert Wayne at UCLA, who's a specialist in canid molecular genetics. And he was able to verify that they all indeed were pure Mexican gray wolf, uh, which is probably what saved the program because that meant that those three lineages could be crossed to reduce the inbreeding that had been accumulating. Something that we had found just before those crosses were allowed was that the semen that we were collecting from those lines, males that were from Aragon, McBride, or Ghost Ranch, was looking of much lower quality than samples that we got from what would be just plain old gray wolves or timber wolves. So uh, motility and morphology means, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but for now, um, motility is what percentage of the, the sperm in a sample are moving and morphology, which means which ones have normal shape. So if either of those are of low percentages, then that sample is probably not fertile. So the standard for gray wolves was up in the 80s or 90%. But for those pure lineage males, they were down in the 60s or in some cases even in the 50s. And anything below 60 is considered infertile. Um, but after crossing, the Mexican wolf crosses, those lineage crosses had sperm that was equivalent in quality to gray wolf. So by being able to cross those inbred wolves, we basically saved their fertility. 
Okay, so what about gene banking? Uh, the program, when it began, uh, we were told to just do whatever they were doing in the Red Wolf program. And the problem with that is that they were just using techniques that had been developed for domestic dogs, and we didn't really know if they were going to work for wolves. So we wanted to do some research. We wanted to make sure we were using the best possible semen freezing technique. We needed to develop artificial insemination for wolves. Nobody was doing that. And we really hoped that we could find a way to preserve genes from females too. At that time in the 1990s, you could only freeze uh, genes in the form of sperm uh, from males. You couldn't do it for females. But then we faced restrictions handling Mexican wolves because it was endangered species. There weren't many of them. Plus, they were spread across all those various zoos throughout the U.S. and Mexico, which meant getting access to them to collect samples was really challenging. So we came up with two alternatives. And one is we want to just look at ovaries and testes and do experiments with them in the lab. It turns out it's pretty easy to get those samples from spay neuter clinics. So the lab in St. Louis has an arrangement with a local clinic and when we need to have ovaries or testes to run some studies, we can get samples there. And if it works well with dog tissue, then we'll try it, apply it to tissue from Mexican wolves. Uh, but we also go to a research facility in Minnesota every year, the Wildlife Science Center, and run studies with their plain old, what we call generic gray wolves or timber wolves, um, and then if we find techniques that work better as we learn things from the outcome of that research, we then can apply that to their Mexican wolf cousins. So our semen research has included something really basic to begin with, like which semen, uh, which anesthetics were best for semen collection. And as it turns out, some kinds of anesthesia, and the males are anesthetized to do the semen collection, uh, some kinds of anesthetics will actually block ejaculation. Others will cause urine contamination of the sample. So we needed to work on that. We also wanted to come up with better extenders. Uh, that's the solution that protects sperm during the freezing process. And then we always want to improve collection protocols and the ways we do semen ass assessments. And in fact, now we even have something called computer assisted sperm motion analysis because sperm motion trajectories and vigor are some of the most important factors for determining whether a sample is going to be fertile. So how do we select those males for banking each year? We can't get to every one of them every year. So we have set priorities based on a couple of different criteria. One is their genetic value to the population. So the goal for genetic management is to equalize representation of those seven founders, to make sure their genes are distributed throughout the population. But also we look at the current representation of a male in the bank. So do we already have a lot of samples from him or do we have none? And if it's a low or no count, then he's got priority. But we're also limited by their location around the country. Wolves have a really short breeding season. Uh, it's only about one month of the year, pretty much February, um, when males are making sperm that's good enough to actually freeze. So we have to look at where they are around the country and prioritize regions where the most valuable males happen to be living that year. So we make it to usually 10 or 12 uh, facilities each year. <laughs> That's quite a lot of travel and uh, schlepping uh, supplies around in a month. Um, but uh, of course it's important to do and we've made that commitment. And we've now worked at 28 of the 36 facilities that are in the US. So how are samples collected? This is what everybody wonders. Well, it's using a process called electroejaculation, and I'll explain that in a moment. But importantly, the male is under general anesthesia. So in one of these pictures, you can see a male at uh, the Endangered Wolf Center in St. Louis uh, that's being prepared for a semen collection, and he has gas anesthesia. 
So the, the semen collection process itself, first we flush the bladder with sterile saline to get all the urine out because if urine happens to come out with the semen, it'll contaminate the sample and ruin it and it can't be frozen. And then the stimulation is applied rectally uh, using very low current. I mean, we've actually touched this with our hands and it's just a tingling sensation, but it's enough to cause contraction of the prostate gland just inside the rectum. And that's where all the seminal fluid comes in and it and comes from in an ejaculate. And so that contraction causes it to pass down into the vas deferens to help wash sperm out that are coming down from the testicles. And then the pudendal nerve is stimulated also, and that causes contraction of the vas deferens so that semen is expelled. So it's a, it's a shortcut around uh, ejaculation that gets us really good samples. And those samples are then analyzed for quality. And so the major factors are motility, as I said before, how they're moving. So how many of them are swimming and then how vigorously they're swimming. And are they normal in shape? Um, scientifically, that's called morphology. And then how many of them are there? Because when we freeze them, we concentrate them so we have a million sperm per mil. And then we know how to calculate an insemination dose. So the freezing process, uh, samples are mixed with that extender and that's something that is formulated to protect the sperm cells from the damage that would occur from ice crystals that form during freezing. And so ice crystals, of course, have those sharp pointy edges and they will cut right through, puncture a cell membrane, which of course would cause the sperm cell to die. Those extenders contain some nutrients, some buffers, and then glycerol is the component that's used as a cryoprotectant. So that's what prevents those ice crystals from forming. The sample is then loaded into straws and it's frozen over liquid nitrogen vapor and then stored indefinitely in liquid nitrogen tanks. And all the samples in the US are held at the St. Louis Zoo. And that's the, the picture on the left. We recently got uh, a very big tank that would hold all the samples. And in Mexico, they have an array of smaller tanks and those are at the Chapultepec Zoo, which is the, is the main zoo in Mexico City. So the total number of males that we've banked over the years, 143 males in the United States and many of those multiple times. And in Mexico, 42, they got a later start than we did. Uh, plus they have a, a smaller population than we do, but that is a total of 182 males. No, that's gonna be 185 males, that's wrong, 185. Um, so although the number of males seems large, there aren't really many straws for a lot of those males. And the number of straws really means insemination doses. So we get about five straws each time we do a semen collection, but four to six straws are needed every time we do an insemination. And often in a female's ovulatory cycle, we actually need to do two inseminations on two separate days. So that means it can take up to eight to 12 straws to produce just one litter of puppies. So we typically tell zoos when we're there, we're probably gonna have to come back and collect from your males again. Uh, more recently, we've also started uh, freezing testicular tissue uh, and that can come from males who have died or if they're castrated uh, for population control measures. And so at this point, in that St. Louis bank, we have samples from 12 individual males. But what about females? As I said, in the 1990s, it wasn't possible to freeze samples from, male, from females. Um, but a new process was developed in a lab in Japan, which was then uh, picked up by a human clinical fertility uh, facility in St. Louis, and their team asked if we wanted to apply this to any of the animals at the zoo. So we started a partnership with them in order to then, it's called vitrifying uh, oocytes, those are the eggs from females and ovarian tissue. 
So there were some challenges. Um, anytime you're working with another species, there are things that are different. So in dogs and wolves, you can't get those oocytes, those eggs, directly from the female wolf. In humans, uh, it's a process that's called ultrasound guided needle biopsy, which means the uh, eggs can be aspirated right from the follicles in the ovaries while the woman is under anesthesia. And her ovaries then remain and she can still ovulate and can still get pregnant. But in dogs and wolves, those ovaries are way up within the body and they're under the backbone up by the kidneys and they're really hard to reach. So we can't do that with ultrasound guided needle biopsy. And we tried a number of different approaches and then gave up and admitted we were going to have to do this surgically. So those ovaries have to be removed, which of course then means that female is no longer fertile. So how do we select those females then, since this is a, um, a life-changing event for those females? We found from a stud book analysis of Mexican wolves that no female that's 12 years of age or older has a history of successful reproduction. So as they get older, it's kind of like they go through menopause, not exactly like with humans, but there it's comparable in a way. So what we know is that it's not likely a female who's 12 or older will reproduce. So spaying her then will retrieve any remaining oocytes. Plus we can freeze her ovarian slices and those contain what are called primordial oocytes that are in a very early stage of development. So those females are spayed at their home institution and then those ovaries are taken to a nearby airport and are sent by a nonstop flight to St. Louis so they can be processed in the gamete lab at the zoo because that has to be done within eight hours for those eggs to be viable. <clears throat> They're then prepared for vitrification, that freeze drying process, uh, by being aspirated. So they're, <clears throat> they're taken from follicles through vacuum with a needle, and then they're moved progressively through solutions that are of increasing ion concentration. And by doing that, that draws the water out of them by uh, osmosis. So once you get the water out, you're not going to have ice crystals as they freeze. They're placed on this, that, that uh, green handled and then blue tipped uh, apparatus that you see. The blue end of it is where the oocytes are placed. So they adhere to that and a little case is put over and this is so that these tiny little things don't get lost inside that uh, vat of liquid nitrogen. So once they're on the cryotop, they're plunged directly into liquid nitrogen. They're basically dry on the inside, remember no water, so we don't have to do this slowly and worry about ice crystal formation. The image in the upper right hand part of the slide shows you what one of those eggs looks like surrounded by what are called cumulus cells. So this is a very healthy looking Mexican wolf egg. So that St. Louis Zoo liquid nitrogen bank now also holds, holds samples from 51 females, and that is more than a thousand oocytes, which is kind of mind boggling, um, and then over 400 ovarian slices. So the summary, what happens now to those samples after they're frozen? So we have started talking about this like um, checking and savings accounts, like bank accounts. So there's long-term and short-term banking. So some samples, especially those from the very genetically valuable uh, males, those that have died and were important uh, in the founder line, are designated for indefinite preservation. So that's like they're in a long-term savings account. We're not gonna use those unless we really need them for something. But in contrast, short-term uh, bank sperm from males that are living now, so if we use it up for our artificial insemination, we can collect more and get that male back in the bank. So we have both long and short-term banking for sperm. But things are different for females. <clears throat> Eggs and ovarian tissue right now are only for, for long-term banking because the techniques to use them aren't fully developed yet. 
And that's because dogs and wolves are special. So when a female dog or wolf ovulates, those eggs need two more days in her reproductive tract to mature before they can be fertilized. So that means if you took those eggs from her um, out of the ovaries, you would need to uh, mature them in vitro, which means in the lab. And despite a lot of work that's been going on, even with domestic dogs, that in vitro maturation stage isn't worked out yet. We are counting on um, all the people who, and it is surprising in some ways, all the people who want to clone dogs uh, are uh, providing a lot of money to people who are doing the research to try to work out this in vitro maturation technique. So we're hoping to piggyback on that and one of these days be able to use those eggs and that ovarian tissue to do in vitro fertilization. Uh, so right now though, we do know from tests that we've done in the lab and this orange blob that you see on the right of the screen is actually um, a live oocyte and it's glowing bright orange because it has a fluorescent stain that designates that it is viable, it is alive. So we've shown that if we thaw these eggs, they are still living. So we know that the process we're using to freeze them isn't damaging them. They should still be viable and able to go through in vitro maturation once that technique is available. But sperm we can use now. And so that's with artificial insemination, AI, um, and, and not artificial intelligence is what is what you're hearing in the media all the time now, which is uh, the computer intelligence. Ours, our AI is artificial insemination. So when can that be important in genetic management? Well, the most important perhaps is to add that male's genes to the population even after he dies. But even in uh, current males to accomplish genetic management, so these animals are distributed across all those different zoos and wolf conservation centers. And if, you, if, if there are animals at different institutions that have breeding recommendations, that means they have to be moved to form new pairs. So if you can do artificial insemination, that means you don't have to ship them around, which is time consuming and can be stressful to the animals. But also for wolves, since they're monogamous, that means if they form a good pair bond in the wild, they would stay together for life. And we see those kinds of pair bonds in captivity as well. So if there's a, a, genetic, rep, recom, a genetic recommendation for a pair that isn't currently together, it is possible then to make that genetic combination with artificial insemination without disrupting that pair. So the first challenge to doing that insemination is timing. It's only going to work if the female is ovulating when you insert the sperm. So detecting the time of ovulation is pretty straightforward and worked out in domestic dogs, but they have to be handled daily for collection of blood samples and vaginal smears. So in wolves, that would mean anesthesia uh, and repeated handling, which is stressful. So there are some individual wolves that we've been able to get regular blood samples from, in fact, at the Wolf Conservation Center the past couple of years. But in most cases, this is really not practical and is very stressful. So it turns out to be better if you can induce ovulation by hormone treatment, and that allows us to then control the time of ovulation so we can time artificial insemination and not have to handle the female as much. So the first product we used was something that had been designed for domestic horses to induce ovulation. And it worked really well for a number of years, but in recent years, there have been problems with that product, um, inconsistency and in some cases failure. So this year we tested something new and it's called Suprelerin. It's a tiny implant and it's the size of a grain of rice or also the size of a microchip that you would put in your dog for identification. And it just has to be inserted under the skin uh, with a large bore needle. And then ovulation, we found, occurred about two weeks later. 
And we were able to take blood samples to monitor, monitor the progression of that stimulation by measuring then progesterone. And it turned out that all but one of the Mexican wolves that had been treated did respond. And here's a graph uh, with the hormone results. So progesterone values across time and the day of treatment. And so as you can see from the key above, the New York uh, wolves were the first three listed there, and they all did respond. There was one female at uh, Endangered Wolf Center outside of St. Louis that did not respond. The Brookfield Zoo, that's the BZ you see up there, didn't have females slated for insemination this year, but they agreed to help us test this ovulation induction protocol. And so they treated two of their females and collected hormone samples for us, but then didn't do inseminations. So only one of those females in St. Louis didn't respond. You can see her progesterone values never went up like it did for the others. And so we'll be following up to try to figure out what went wrong with her. But the step after ovulation is induced then, of course, is to inseminate. And uh, we've known from work with a lot of species, including dogs, that vaginal insemination has a very low success rate. And then in the early 90s, especially, and in even into the early 2000s, the common way to do insemination um, in a domestic dog was surgically. So to do a small incision in the abdomen and to put the sperm sample directly into the uterine horn. But both the Mexican Wolf SSP members and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's uh, Mexican Wolf Recovery Team believed that surgical approach was not advisable for Mexican wolves, so we had to develop another non-surgical technique. And so uh, we first tested that with fresh semen, and now we're working on uh, testing it with frozen thawed semen. So the first of those techniques that we tried was called the Norwegian catheter system. And Dr. Ragnar Thomason from the University of Oslo worked with us and he had uh, worked this out with dogs and with foxes in Norway. And the dog you see on the table there on the left, this husky, she's fully awake, she's in natural estrus and he has an insemination catheter in her vagina and going into her cervix. He's, with his right hand, he's palpating her cervix through her abdomen and feeling where the catheter is and then easing that catheter through her cervix and into her uterus to deposit the sperm sample directly into the uterus. She's fully awake, so clearly this isn't an unpleasant uh, procedure for her. Still, we have to anesthetize wolves because we can't handle wolves like that. And there you see on the right, Dr. Uh, Thomason doing the procedure with an anesthetized wolf at uh, the Wolf Center in Minnesota. But that takes a lot of finesse. Dr. Thomason is really good at palpating the cervix through the abdomen and knowing when it's the right time but most people can't learn that. And so we identified some colleagues in the United States who do a lot of insemination with domestic dogs and use an endoscope. So that's a camera on the end of, and you see that in the center of the slide, that metal instrument goes into the vagina, it has a camera on the end, and then a catheter is inserted in the middle of that instrument and the catheter then goes through the cervix and into the uterus. So the arrow in the upper right picture, that's actually an endoscope picture of a cervix. So that wrinkly pink, pink tissue is the cervix of a Mexican wolf. And then uh, the catheter itself shows up as a white body with a metallic tip. And so that's just getting ready to enter the opening of the cervix to slide into the uterus. So our colleagues are Dr. Bruce Christensen, who's out in California, and then Dr. Chong, who's at the Cornell Veterinary School. So Dr. Chong is the one who then drives to the Wolf Conservation Center there in New York to do procedures. And um, Dr. Christensen has done procedures at some other locations in uh, the central and western part of the US. So our history with TCI, that trans-cervical insemination, 
Um, we started in 2005, um, and uh, all three females that were inseminated with fresh semen, this hadn't been frozen, uh, produced litters of puppies. It went really well, and that was with hormone stimulation of ovulation. Um, then and from 2000 to 2018, that looks like a really long time, but during most of those years, there was a breeding moratorium for Mexican wolves based on uh, some problems uh, in Mexi New Mexico and Arizona about reintroduction, a moratorium on reintroductions. So breeding was pretty much halted in the captive breeding program as well. So even though that looks like it was a lot of years, it was only a few inseminations. Uh, nine females were inseminated with frozen thawed semen and only one pup was produced. Although that was, most of those problems came along with the time that that product we were using to stimulate ovulation was causing some problems. It wasn't working well for us. Uh, so this year we have higher hopes since we seem to have had a better response from this new product. And we did artificial insemination of four females with frozen thawed semen. We don't know yet for sure the outcome because those births would be expected in early April in the next couple of weeks. But three females at the Wolf Conservation Center there in New York were inseminated and one at the Endangered Wolf Center in Missouri. Uh, Follow-up ultrasound of that one Missouri female showed her to be pregnant, so we have high hopes for her. The ultrasound uh, done, exam done at the Wolf Conservation in New York was inconclusive, so we don't know for sure whether there'll be puppies. We've got our fingers crossed. We hope that that was just missed. So what's next? Uh, well, that depends almost entirely on the outcomes for the things that we've done this year. So for instance, how many of those females that we inseminated actually give birth to puppies? So if we don't have many births, then we have to figure out what went wrong. Was it something that had to do with the ovulation induction uh, or was it the sperm itself? So was it, were, the, were the sperm samples inadequate? Is there something about the freezing technique that's not resulting in sperm being fertile. So that will be back to the drawing board for us if that turns out to be a problem. But other questions for follow up, for instance, why didn't that one endangered wolf center female respond to the hormone stimulation when those others did? Uh, so what might be different about her? What could have gone wrong? But we will always continue uh, to try to improve the post thaw semen quality uh, because new techniques are coming along all the time. Luckily for us, domestic dogs can be a model that we can draw from and semen freezing and artificial insemination are becoming increasingly popular for domestic dogs. So that means research funding going into that kind of work, which then much more funding and many more animals available for research than we would ever have access to. So we can benefit from that and try promising uh, new techniques on our generic gray wolves in Minnesota and then hope we can find uh, better techniques to try to improve fertilization rates in the Mexican wolf. There's always something more to do. Um, so <laughs> This slide I use in a lot of my talks uh, that often at the end of research projects, you realize you found some answers, but you've also raised a lot of questions. But for this talk as well, um, you may have questions. Uh, and if you do, I'll try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, so we'll go ahead and take some questions uh, now. Uh, but first, for those of you who joined after the introduction, we're here with Dr. Sherry Asa, and she just finished her talk on the role of reproductive management in the Mexican, in Mexican gray wolf recovery. And uh, for those with questions, please be sure to type the questions into the Q&A box in the control panel. Okay, so the first question asks, um, does the advanced age of the females at spaying, greater than 12 years old, mean that the eggs may be lower quality than those of a younger pre-menopausal? Uh, female? That's a really good question and it shows you know about the results from humans and we know we're running that chance. 
Um, although we can show, as I said, that they're still viable, but we do expect uh, fertility rates to be lower than would be the case if we could get those oocytes from very young females. But given the reproductive anatomy of wolves, it's just so hard to get uh, samples from a wolf and leave that ovary intact so she can continue breeding. We'd really hesitate to remove ovaries from very young females because that then removes them from the, the breeding population. Something we might consider in the future uh, is maybe taking one ovary from a young female to save those oocytes and still leave her one remaining ovary to contribute naturally to the population. That's something that we've not addressed with the SSP yet though. Okay. Um, is there any genetic testing done on the sperm or eggs to sequence the genes and look for possible mutations? No, no one has, has proposed doing that with the wolves. Um, the, you wouldn't have to look at the sperm's genes because the genes in every cell of the body are the same. Um, in fact, in each sperm cell, there's really only half the complement of genes um, that would be in a somatic cell. So the molecular geneticists, like out of Dr. Wayne's lab, and there are a couple of other uh, labs around the country that spend a lot of effort looking at uh, wolf and other canid uh, genetics, that we count on them to do that kind of work. We do, although now and then they will ask us for a sperm sample, uh, to go along with blood samples or skin samples that we're using, but we don't do that genetic work ourselves. Okay. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, how long do eggs and sperm remain viable after death? So if an animal dies and we want to retrieve the sample, I am assuming that's what it means. So it depends on the temperature. So it turns out that eggs need to be kept warm at body temperature. So when an animal dies, uh, that body begins to cool to ambient temperature. So the, the samples, you know, the ovaries would have to be removed very quickly. Uh, the other is that those samples need, those oocytes need to be removed from the follicles and put into protective media uh, within eight hours. So if it happens at the Wolf Center just outside of St. Louis, that's just a 20 minute car ride and that's possible. But if it's somewhere else around the country, it means being um, sent by plane. And so that can be a challenge to try to get this to the St. Louis lab within eight hours. When we schedule those um, surgeries for spaying, then we know to accept the sample. We know what fl flight it's coming on. We have the team ready in the lab, ready to grab those ovaries and start working on them right away. But if it would be coming from a female who died, logistically, it would be much more challenging. For males though, it's better if the sperm do cool. So as the body cools, that's not a bad thing. Uh, and it's good that it cools slowly. And it's possible to take the testes from a male who has died and ship overnight. So we can send by FedEx, uh, in, and usually with an ice pack, so it's kept cool, not frozen, but cool, uh, sent overnight by FedEx and gets to the St. Louis lab the next day and uh, sperm can be taken from the epididymis, and then uh, sperm tissue can be frozen from uh, the testis itself. Interesting. Um, I'm assuming this is uh, regarding the uh, oocytes, but uh, are there any infection um, concerns with this procedure? Um, if so, are there any preventative measures applied? So infections, hmm. uh, the, the conditions that we use to do the collection are all, I mean, they're collected under surgery. The ovaries are taken out and, you know, sterile conditions in surgery. They're kept sterile when they're transferred to us. Everything is kept clean and sterile. The media are clean. So the samples should not have any contamination. 
uh, when they go into freezing. Um, if this is, if the question was more about introducing infection, if uh, you would actually do an uh, in vitro fertilization and then move that uh, embryo into a female, then antibiotics are used along with those procedures. And in fact, there are antibiotics in the semen extenders. Uh, when we freeze semen, uh, antibiotics are built right in that pre prevent any transmission of uh, uh, pathogens that might be there. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another. Uh, do you ever make breeding decisions to avoid undesirable traits, like the occurrence of certain cancers? That has not been the practice. Uh, so again, <laughs> we follow the recommendations of the population geneticists. I'm not a geneticist, I'm a reproductive physiologist, but my understanding from meetings with them and discussions with them is that especially in a species with so few founders, if you begin trying to select for or select for or against particular traits, you run the risk of losing perhaps really important founder genes in that mix. So I don't know of any cases where deleterious traits, though any perceived bad traits in a population that's being managed by the AZA population geneticists, I don't know of any cases where animals have been removed from the breeding population because they have a problem like that. That doesn't mean uh, someone might not change that strategy, but at this point, I don't know of any exceptions. That makes sense. Um, this one's about freezing methods. Uh, I've read that uh, pellets are used for red wolves and you're talking about straws. Is one better than the other? What's the difference? Great question. When we started freezing Mexican wolf sperm, uh, I was actually instructed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service representative to go train with the man who was freezing red wolf sperm. So they had a head start on us. Um, and so we did use pellets like red wolf still does. Uh, but over the years, as research was published for domestic dog, they were finding that straws were better. So we ran a study with those generic gray wolves up in Minnesota and directly compared in split samples uh, straws versus pellets. And we got better survivability in sperm that had been frozen in straws than sperm that had been frozen in pellets. So at that time, we switched to straws. Some of our old samples that were banked in uh, the 1990s are in the form of pellets, though. Thank you. Um, let's see. Are there any special uh, permits required to send um, semen samples or egg samples across the border since they're an endangered species? Yes, there would have to be. We've not done that yet. We've had parallel programs up until this point, but it would be just like sending an endangered whole wolf. You would have to go through that permitting process. But the actual shipment, the shipment itself, would be much easier than shipping that whole wolf. Okay. What is the rate of natural reproduction of wolves released into the wild? Oh, wow, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, <clears throat> one of the problems even with calculating that, is it's impossible to know how many females give birth. All that can be counted is how many puppies appear uh, once they come out of the den. And wolves um, keep their puppies in a den for about three weeks, and a lot can happen in three weeks. Uh, so an entire litter could be lost. Uh, or some of the puppies could be lost. Uh, and even after they come out of uh, the den, it's possible that some of them, those puppies are killed for some reason or another uh, before the Fish and Wildlife Service does their census. So I don't know what that rate is, and I'm not even sure that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologists know that rate. Okay, 
well, it looks like that is it for questions. Um, we've covered them all. Sherry, is there anything else you wanted to cover before we wrap up? Uh, no, I thought those were great questions. And so I hope I've covered um, whatever anyone would be interested in. And uh, I appreciate being able to talk about the work that we do. Oh, Sherry, thank you so much uh, for really sharing what you're doing. I think it's very interesting. And I always enjoy when you come and visit us and, and teach our staff and volunteers about all of this. So um, we appreciate you being here. And for everyone that was able to join, Thank you too. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Wolf Conservation Center uh, or our scientific webinar series or the 47 wolves uh, who call the center home, please visit our website at nywolf.org. And Sherry, thanks again for offering your time to discuss this interesting topic. Thank you. All right, thanks again, everyone. See you next time. <laughs>